So Paul Krugman, welcome to Stockholm. Well, thank you. Uh, and congratulations on the award of the Bank of Sweden Prize in Economic Sciences. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's in a way a funny time to be awarded in, in the midst of the economic crisis. It must make it difficult. Uh, yes, uh, well, I mean, um, my wife after a, a brief uh, moment of exaltation said, you know, uh, we don't have time for this because uh, I've been very involved mm. writing, speaking, a little bit of consulting. Indeed, the, the morning you got the telephone call from the committee, you were actually on your way to a crisis meeting in Washington. Exactly. We were heading for, I was about to step into the shower before rushing off to this meeting where people were going to be t talking about the crisis, which is what everyone talks about now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how big a crisis do you feel it's going to be? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, it's... Um, Without policy, without an active policy response, it would be another Great Depression. It really is a, uh, a financial crisis rivaling in scale the bank runs that were really at the core of what turned the, what 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 made the Great Depression so great. And so, no, this is this is um, like nothing that has happened in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find yourself being talked to more because? of the award of the Nobel Prize in October? Has it, has it increased the focus on you, do you think? Oh, some, but I was pretty busy anyway. I mean, it's mm. certainly, I'm probably getting, I say, a higher quality of, of TV show, but in some sense the, uh, um, but this was one of the lines of work I have had is in fact financial crises. I uh, write for the New York Times, mm. so I'm a, something of a public figure anyway, mm. and this crisis is very much up you know, we, we can say it's up my alley, um, my kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that I used to have to fly off to Jakarta or Buenos Aires to see, but now it's in New York, and so it's, it's a, um, you know, I'm in the middle of it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it make it more difficult to report on it, because you have this journalistic side to you, as well as at the same time try and suggest solutions to it? Oh, I mean, it's a special role. It, it, because of the, I, actually, I'm, a I'm an opinion journalist, so... Uh, I'm expected to do stuff, and in fact, I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm basically trying to work on multiple tracks here. I write the 800-word um, layman's pieces for the New York Times. I write longer pieces that you, some are posted on my blog. Some various sorts of things that are are more addressed to, to economists. And then there's an enormous amount of um, off-the-record discussion uh, okay. of various types going on. With uh, so the. Uh, that this crisis is not going to, if, if we fail to deal with it, it's not going to be because of lack of um, intelligent and uh, very animated discussion. We'll come back to the op-ed piece and the journalism later. And, and of course, you're known to many as, a, as an economics and political commentator, especially through the New York Times pieces. But this prize is actually for your development of economic models to explain international trade and economic uh, geography. That's right. I mean, I, you know, I... I until the age of uh, 40, I was very much a pure academic, and uh, um, and my big, you know, the, the uh, still what I think, if, if anyone remembers 50 years from now, what they'll remember is the work on trade and geography, which was, you know, is, is fundamental um, about some big questions, enduring questions in economics. But, um, you know, academics uh, in their mid-50s in, in economics quite often are doing other things, you know. Uh, so my cohort um, in, uh, uh, in, in graduate school included uh, people like Jeff Sachs and Larry Summers, who seem to have done a few things beyond their economic modeling. So, so it, it's not that unusual to be doing something, although it's, you know, it, it, it's, it, but the, yes, I tell people the prize is not about the columns. The mm. prize is about um, papers that you can't read. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. I think you refer to them as Greek letter papers. That's right. right. Yeah. The, uh, yes, we do. Uh, you know, there, there's. Um, I spent a good part of my life using you know constant elasticity of substitution, utility functions, and iceberg transportation costs, and uh, true price indices, and all of the various tools that one uses to simplify these issues on trade and, and geography down to something where you can actually think about them clearly, and. Um, I'm not going to put that in the in the in the daily newspaper, but uh, the, that that is that's where you start. Mm, mm, mm. What turned you on to being an economics? Oh, sorry, an economist in the first place. Oh, yeah, it's an embarrassing story, but I've told it publicly a couple of times. So, um, I was an avid science fiction reader when I was a teenager, and there's the classic set of novels by Isaac Asimov, the Foundation novels, 
which are about how a group of social scientists save galactic civilization through their understanding of the laws that determine the behavior of societies. And uh, I wanted to be one of those guys. Uh, and the closest you can get at this point, I'm afraid, is being an economist. Do you, do you still believe that economists have that role? Oh, you know, the, um, in the novels, these people are able to predict with high accuracy what's going to happen and find the precise intervention that, that saves civilization. Um, economics doesn't work that good. Uh, but, um, but no, it's, it's, it, there's a tr tremendous amount of understanding that comes from economic models. And sometimes that understanding can be, can be the salvation of the economy. Uh, I believe that we're in, living in one of those times right now. If we had only the level of economic knowledge that the world had in 1929, I believe we would have another Great Depression. The reason to believe that that won't happen is that we think we understand this thing at least somewhat better than our grandfathers did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I w this is, is a perfect segue because I wanted to ask you about the development of models. You, it was in 1979 that you published your new trade theory. Right. Um, and that is a, a, a theory, a model explaining why similar countries trade in similar goods. That's right. Now, one can express the model in the theory in fairly sort of self-evident terms, simple language, and it all sounds as if it makes sense. And yet, one needs an, a, a theoretical underpinning based on proper economic science in order to really understand. Yes, the, you know, the, it's an interesting thing because the plain English came later. It's not as if there was an intuitive story that was widely understood and what I did was find a way to mathematically model it. What actually happened was that I and a number of other people started using these models to try and model something. It was a little bit unclear exactly what it was we were trying to get at. And as the models became clearer, they crystallized an intuition which you could then say, of course, it's, it's a little bit bit like the old joke about the professor at the blackboard saying, obviously then, then he stops and pauses for 20 minutes and he says, I, I'm right, it was obvious. Uh, and and the, the, these, these simple intuitive stories that we can now tell, I can now explain in a few hundred words in plain English what drives intra-industry trade among advanced countries. Um, but no one was doing that before. It, it really took the, the modeling. It's, uh, um, you know, as, as, as it happens, having been there, I, I remember how hard it was to try and figure out which way the strategic simplifications needed to go to make this thing coherent. And then afterwards it seems, well, of course, it's obvious, but that's, that's very much an after-the-fact uh, interpretation. Mm. Do you think that that's perhaps a sort of peculiarity of economic sciences? That in, in other sciences, I don't know, biology or chemistry, even when you try and explain the theory in simple language, the language you're using is an, an, a strange language, a language that's particular to the subject. Whereas economics, when anyone explains it, you use the English, whatever, language that everybody understands. And so everybody feels they ought to be able to sort of get in there and I'm massage not, it. It's not even true of all economics. Okay. I mean, it's, um, it, and it's not necessarily that we're talking about the highly technical fields. Um, I think the, as it happens, the work, the areas in which I worked, uh, trade, economic geography, the concepts are, for the most part, pretty intuitive, although, you know, there's quite a lot of stuff that pops up when you work through it that, that is not part of the intuition. I'm, you're, I'm sacrificing quite a lot to, to explain it just in plain English. Mm. But there are other things, um, Keynesian macroeconomics, which is critical right now. Although it's quite simple in a way, it's also, there's, there's a subtlety about the concept that really does require, if not math, at least some very, very close logic um, and to which it, what's rev what, what, it is, what reveals that fact is that so many people to this day uh, just don't get it or actively deny it saying mm -hmm. this can't be true and uh, I think that well there's some of that in a lot of economics but it's not uh, it's not as if all of it can be reduced to plain English no but uh, I'm, I'm probably doing it clumsily but what I was trying to get to was, was the idea that because there is some plain English about it, people feel they ought to be able to sort of get to it themselves even if they haven't got an economics training, whereas they just don't touch chemistry because it's, it's too far outside. And that, that lays 
perhaps economists open to people feeling, oh, well, I could have understood that, I could have done that. Yes, and also, of course, economics is, I mean, my, one of the great definitions by uh, Alfred Marshall was that economics is about the, um, the, the ordinary business of life. Economics is about getting and spending, and we're all engaged in getting and spending, so we all think we know about it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's this constant belief that uh, we should, it, that you go to a great businessman for wisdom about the economy. And it turns out it's actually not, that's not, often doesn't work. That, that what you need to know to run a business and what you need to understand to make good economic policy are not at all the same thing. And um, so, that, yes, pe but people have a sense that they know what economics is about. People have strong prejudices. They, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's not that easy. Um, uh, I, I'm a, my great idol in, in, uh, among economists is John Maynard Keynes, and uh, it has a, he had a spectacularly accurate essay at the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, the Great Slump of 1930, and but a little bit of temper shows that at some point he says, economics, though no one will believe it, is a difficult and technical subject, and, and it is. It's, you, you know, if you're very, if you're very careful, you can manage to write to make it seem clear, but it is actually fairly difficult and technical when all is said and done. Mm -hmm. What makes a good modeler in economics? Oh, you know, there are many different ways. Then one of the things you learn, I think, and this is true of uh, physical sciences as well, is that there are many different personality types uh, who who work in distinct ways. So there are people, you know, my style. I'm I'm a ruthless simplifier. I, I you know pare away everything. I I try to make the the math disappear, and I. It never quite does, but it, I work very. But I'm I'm a, I'm a little model guy. I say, here's this huge complex subject. There's got to be some little model that will get to the essence of it. Sometimes there isn't. There are also people who are generalizers who will look for some general theorems, general ways that you can think about a large subject. Uh, um, there are people who are uh, um, magnificently good at sifting through large amounts of data, finding ways to process that data to extract conclusions. It, you know, they're, they're just very many different personalities. There's a certain style um, kind of identified actually with, uh, with MIT, which is where I did my graduate work, which is the, the, the little model that, uh, that cuts through to the essence of a complex problem. But that's not the only, there, there are many different ways you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think what it does take, though, is you do have, um, there's some requirement that you be able to to step back and, and see things differently. Say that you know the way that, that everyone is talking about something is not actually maybe the way we should be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, 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 that ability to take a sideways look at things is something that you've very much used in your journalistic um, career. Yeah, you know, try it's, it, yeah, there, is, there is certainly some continuity. The, uh, being able to say, hey, uh, the, the conventional wisdom about, uh, um, oh, you name it, but the, uh, certainly about, about the economics, look, the, uh, uh, the the ability to say that hey you know maybe these electricity shortages in California there's something funny here there seems to be a lot of idle capacity let's think this through and 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 then saying you know circumstantial evidence strongly suggests that this market is being rigged yeah, and see. then later we got actually found the tapes but uh, um, so but that's that's very much the same sort of thing as saying you know maybe trade between industrial countries is not about comparative advantage it's mm -hmm. it's a there there is an attitude of mind. Mm -hmm. So the, the second model that the prize committee have um, quoted is your core periphery model, which yeah. was also mentioned in 79 and then further developed in 91. Oh, there, there's just a hint of it in 79. I know. There, sometimes I look back at the 79 paper and I say, you know, I had it. There seem to be premonitions of lots of later stuff in there, but it's not actually there. Uh, the, um, the core periphery model, that's still... Um, that's, that's the love of my life in terms of, uh, of uh, academics, because the, 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 the being able to say that um, increasing returns makes stuff clump together, that's not so hard. But being able to get this tension between the forces that pull things together and the forces that pull them apart, uh, and that, 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 that made me very happy when it fell together. Because it's not one of those things where it, it sounds very simple, but um, it actually took years of false starts before getting to the point where it actually suddenly cohered. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, because it sounds as if it's ex that you're just describing the process of urbanization, which we're sort of witnessing around us. That's right. But there's, uh, but no, in fact, it, in fact, one of the slanders against uh, economists, people used to say, you know, you just, this stuff is just circular. You say that uh, things agglomerate because of agglomeration economies, which was kind of the way that people talked about it. And to say, no, actually, we can derive those agglomeration economies. They're about market size. Yeah. But to do it in such a way that you can say, but they're also, um, centripetal forces that make uh, people, that gives you some advantage to moving away from where everybody else is, and then some kind of boundary condition that determines which of those prevails, that was, uh, um, that was not the way anybody was thinking about it until, until this new, new economic geography came along. Right. And what sort of predictive capability does the core periphery model give you? Well, a lot of it is more sort of retrocasting. I mean, the, um, the model has a, a story about um, what would happen in, uh, and, and there, there are three factors that would push you across that boundary to where they, the, uh, the, uh, the centripetal forces outweigh the centrifugal forces, um, which are reducing transport costs, increasing economies of scale, growing share of non-resource-based industries. And then you look back and you say, we can see that phase transition in the United States about um, about 1855, uh, when all of a sudden industry stops following the frontier west and instead st sticks in, the, in the, uh, the manufacturing belt. So you get that. Um, not sure the core periphery model per se, but models derived from it um, have, um, uh, have, I think, had some successful predictions. I mean, one of the things um, Early on in the process of European integration, writing just after I'd come out with the, the initial model, began to say, you know, they, these, the deep integration that's taking place in Europe, if we believe these sorts of models, should actually lead European economies to become more different from each other in a lot of ways, increasing specialization. And lo and behold, that has happened. Mm -hmm. So you, you get, I think there are some successful predictions out of the approach. Right, right, right. And interventions, presumably, also that one could think of. That's actually less less clear. I mean, it's uh, um, the very nature of the model, with the tension between reasons to disperse and reasons to agglomerate, also suggests that there's a. Um, uh, in principle, it's, it's this is not an invisible hand situation where the market gets it right, but it can get it wrong in more ways than one. And trying to figure out which way you want to push the stuff is not so easy. So actually, it, it's yes. I mean, there's subtle. There's certainly there are implications about about policy. Uh, it, it certainly means that you should be looking into it, but it's not a simple, you know, let's let's push everybody into the cities or let's push put everybody into uh, into rural development programs. It, it's actually turned out to be quite hard to come up with mm. with what the policy implications are. Thank you. Let's turn from model building to journalism. Um, during the '90s, you became um, active in. Um, writing for a number of different um, organs, and then you, and then in '99 you si signed the deal with New York Times, which right. for a twice weekly uh, op-ed column. Yes, that's uh, that's yeah. it, that, that's um, my theory about the time commitment was that the Times would be very nearly an exclusive commitment that uh, uh, no business consulting, no none of the things that middle-aged academics do because those all pose conflict of interest issues. So actually the Times would, in effect, give me an external backbone to say no to people who wanted me to, you know, fly off to Singapore and talk to a bunch of investment bankers. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and it's, it's largely worked out that way. I'm not sure that the drain on my time has been that much more than the other stuff that I might have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it was different. Um, it's not, I think I'm not the first economist to write for newspapers, uh, but the first to take on that kind of regular gig, I think, is, is new. Absolutely. And your approach to this production is that um, you, you base it around the numbers. Your, your reports are basically yes. uh, based on analysis of the numbers that other people aren't, aren't doing. That's right. I mean, obviously, there's been a political component, and there, there have been issues like the war in Iraq, where I, I you know, took a non-mainstream non, non uh, point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but on the, in much of it, uh, it's... Looking at the numbers, looking at uh, at the logic, um, gets you a long way. Most you know most 
most journalists, even in the business area, are not really that comfortable with with uh, with thinking these things through. So, so I am, I think, uh, at least different enough to to be a useful voice on the scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, there must be quite a lot of people who are qualified to look at the numbers, but as you say, not that many people who are in the position to have a wide audience to look at what they're saying. That's right. And it, so, yeah, to some extent, I, I think there are probably uh, other economists who could have done this job as well, mm -hmm. but, uh, but not, not reaching this, this large... And part, partly I serve as translator. I mean, on many issues, there is, in fact, some academic literature, some academic research going on that... But it's not known. It's not getting reported, and I can read the stuff, so I can then and then translate into English, uh, which is not that easy a job, actually. It, it's a, it is a huge commitment of time, and, and also you uh, you need to produce. You need to produce quality material at such a pace. And a lot of academics will like to talk about how even you know the three-year grant deadlines and the five-year grant deadlines they work on are quite limiting to their ability to think. So having to produce every few days something must be. Well, my old my running explanation has been that you know your uh, your twice weekly column doesn't have to be Nobel quality research, and in fact the uh, Nobel committee didn't consider that right. So, uh, so no, I mean, it, but it doesn't have to be something that would startle hmm. a trained economist. It has to be something that is news to a an intelligent but non technical audience. So it's not that hard and. You know, if there was a shortage of stuff happening to write about, then I suppose it might be quite difficult to keep the flow going. But in these past eight years, there has never been a shortage of stuff happening. But it, it needs quite a lot of background. You need to be sure of yourself. Because it, right. it, one of the things that the analysis of the numbers led you to do was to criticize the Bush administration um, earlier than a lot of people were doing. And so you need to be pretty sure of where you are. Right, but... Um, you, you work on it for a while. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it took me... Uh, about four months during the 2000 campaign before I was willing to come out and say, say look, these people are being dishonest. This, the, these are, these are uh, they're lying about their own numbers. Uh, so you, you get familiar with it and then you work, work forward. And also, of course, it's journalism. So um, if you should happen to be wrong, uh, it's going to happen. If you're, if you're never wrong on these things, then you're not taking enough chances. It's not, it's not like uh, academic research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, in 2007, you introduced a blog to go alongside your... Right. Your columns. Well, I, I, I imagine you. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I imagine you're the first Nobel laureate to have a regular blog. I wonder if that's true. Yeah, it may might not be. be. Yeah. My, may, well, um, but uh, it's you know, in some ways, I was a proto blogger um, back in the late '90s. I was posting many pieces about the financial crises on on my personal web page. So, that, that in some ways, I was a blogger before there were blogs. But then I went away from that because I was writing a regular piece for the Times. But in 2007, it became clear to me that there were really two kinds of things I wanted to do, fast reaction pieces and things that were more technical than belonged in the newspaper proper. Mm -hmm. So the, the blog is a, a perfect answer to that. It, uh, I, and, you know, I f a fair number of my p posts on the blog, um, I actually just include in parentheses wonkish as a warning that you know my general readers, you really don't want to read this. <laughs> Right, right. And does the blog have a have a very large audience? I think it does. I haven't checked lately, but I believe I'm you know in the uh, top five most read economics blogs or something like that. Mm. And, and but mostly it, it just it's it's a it's certainly you know people are aware of it. I, I, mm. People in uh, in academics, but also in in the policy world, uh, say, well, you know, yes, uh, you, know, you have this blog post, and what does that mean for what we ought to be doing in this legislation? Mm -hmm. uh, so I. I suppose one further step might be um, to take on, a, now that you're writing so much about politics, to take on a political uh, take political office. I know that during the Clinton administration you were approached about a, a job in the administration. Not really exactly, no. Okay. I was uh, but you might, I was actually in the Reagan administration, which is hard to believe, but uh, I was uh, you know, non-political non level. I was on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors where I was the senior international economist. Uh, the senior domestic economist was... What's his name? Summers, Larry Summers. Don't mm -hmm. know what happened to him. <laughs> so, um, so we had, you know, this is going away. So, but actually, partly because of that, I know what the policy world is like, and I don't think I belong here. Mm. I think actually, um, I'm a terrible administrator, first of all. So you don't want me in anything that requires administration, um, and 
am not a very good you know, negotiator. All of these things that, that are, I, I think I'm a good, or, you know, I like to think I'm a good analyst, um, but I don't think I'm a good bureaucrat or of, of any kind. Um, and you know, I might think differently if I wasn't at the Times, but as it is, I have a, a mouthpiece, people are listening. Uh, it's, I probably can have as much influence, let's say, on the shape of this coming economic stimulus package from where I am as I could if I were you know, a, uh, the third ranking member of the Obama economics team, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably as good, as good a position as any. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that sort of makes null and void my next question, which is going to be: you you intend to continue to continue writing for the Times for the foreseeable future? Anyway. For at least, yes. I mean, I don't know about forever, but yeah. uh, but it's yeah. The Times is a. Um, I have to say, in in. It, it's become in recent months, more of an economics column and less less political than it had been, partly because. We won't have George Bush to kick around anymore, uh, and partly because uh, the economic situation is so dire. Mm -hmm. And in a strange way, that makes me, um, it doesn't make the actual workload less, but it makes the emotional wear and tear less. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually finding that I'm enjoying the column more than probably I have at any point in the past eight years. Because, mm -hmm. yes, because you, you, you've, you've solicited a lot of um, comment from outside. So. Well, the, no, it was, cer it, was, it was certainly, there, were, there was a pretty fair number of, uh, Accusations of treason and so on. Uh, back when I was being critical of the president, but the, uh, but um, but now I really feel it. That, that you know, it's not. There's there was a long period when I felt like I was the voice crying in the wilderness, saying, you know, how can you believe these people? They're they're trying to sell you on a war, and the evidence isn't there. Um, now I'm in a position of saying, you know, we have this crisis. Here's some things we got to do, and 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 people are listening. Whether they'll do what I say, or, I don't know. But it really is a. Um, it's much less of a feeling of, of, of uh, this sort of panic that no one was, was willing to look at what was obvious. I think people are, are actually, we're now having a real discussion. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if my view doesn't prevail, it's a real discussion. Mm -hmm. There's just one other side of your writing I wanted to ask about, which were books, because you produce quite a lot of books. Yeah. Some of them are, uh, um, like The Great Unraveling, are, are reprints of the columns, but others right. are written st standalone things. Um, what, what part do the books play in, in your sort of outreach? Well, I've had two kinds of books. I've had uh, what amount to professional monographs, mm -hmm. which, which are useful because they're, sometimes you have a longer story to tell than you can do in articles. And so mm -hmm. the uh, market structure and foreign trade uh, with Health on Health Bond back was, was sort of crystallizing, putting together, integrating the, the new trade theory work, or geography and trade, which was the new economic geography in a, in a, a longer format. Um, but then the public books, well, if, if you have a longer argument, um, you know, there's, the, the Times is a wonderful place. It, it, lots of people read it, but it's 800 words. Mm. Yeah, you know, it, it's, um, there's, and, and you have to, yeah, and, and those 800 words have to be comprehensible. It can't be too dense. Has to a little bit start by telling people where you're, what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, and with all of that, there's room for only a very, you know, a, a core of, of an argument, but no sustained development of a logic. And even longer pieces don't do that. So there's nothing quite like being able to have a 250, 300 page book which actually lays out some longer case. Mm -hmm. But but obviously very readable because they get to the top of the bestseller, bestseller lists. And people well, like them. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, I mean, again, it's, uh, you know, I, um, I think I write decent English. It's not, uh, um, n that didn't come automatically. I actually started writing uh, newspaper columns way back in 1987, I think, for the Los Angeles Times. And they were terrible. And uh, <laughs> you know, you, I've gradually learned how to, how to do this. I just want, for the last question, I want to take you just a little further back. In 1978, you wrote a paper called A Theory of Interstellar Trade. Yes, which is now uh, finally going to be published <laughs> is in, it in Economic Inquiry. So, uh, and to, to just uh, encapsulate the argument there? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I was having those assistant professor woes, uh, uh, feeling neglected, whatever. So I, I, uh, for therapy, I wrote this. The idea was that 
if you're shipping goods for long periods over very long distances, or certainly in the 18th century when you ship goods, the time in transit was an important part of the cost. It's even true now to some extent. The, the, the interest costs on, on, on stuff on, on its way on a slow boat from China uh, is an important part of the transport cost. So, well, this will certainly be true for interstellar trade where the voyages are very long, but the time in transit depends upon the velocity of the, the observer. So um, once we take relativistic effects uh, into account, uh, which, which time should we be using for the interest costs? So this is assuming that we achieve um, speeds of travel that are near the speed of light. That's right. And so you know, obviously it was, just, it was just fun. So I, uh, I got to put a diagram in Minkowski space-time, which uh, has an imaginary uh, time axis. And so the diagram is blank because uh, if, the, if an axis is imaginary, the whole diagram must be imaginary. <laughs> that sort of thing. So I, I was clearly, I was having a good time. It's, it's, it's just a paper waiting its time. You That's not, right. You may not be around to see its uptake, but... Uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, splendid. Um, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. Okay. And we wish you a wonderful week in Stockholm. Thank you.